Sturdy Empire rifle. Check. Big spiky thing on the end. Check. Moustache. Check. Kilt. Ah, rats. Never mind. I thought I'd go join the club there. Anyway, welcome to the workshop uh, for a little show and tell of this lovely Mark I Martini. And I'll try not to impale the ceiling. Um, yes, you might have seen this uh, on and off on vids and uh, reloading videos and Facebook pictures. Um, but I thought you'd deserve a, a closer look at it. Um, not often you come across a Mark I. Um, so this is actually something of a hybrid. It's between the second pattern and third pattern because there are different stages within the Mark I, as is traditional in the British uh, firearms development system. And um, so yes, this didn't have a, let's say, it's not a finite pattern. There's some little features that remain and extra bits, but, um, but it's all matching and all original. So it's just uh, how its service life progressed, I guess. Um, I actually found it in Holland, so. Goodness knows how it happened up there. Anyway, um, the first pattern basically uh, was used for testing troop trials uh, and that kind of thing, ironing out the kinks, and that never made it to full-scale, large-scale production. Um, it had a safety, which would have a little lever on the side here, which was very quickly abolished because A, it was unnecessarily complicated, and B, borderline unsafe. Quite ironic. So that's uh, abolished quite quickly. You'll actually still find it on things like um, the Romanian and Turkish Peabody Martinis. Uh, they held onto it a bit longer, but even they, in the end, chucked it in. Um, then the uh, second, so Mark I, second pattern, that was the one that went more into full-scale production. And actually, uh, the Canadians got the first batch. And it's uh, probably one of those that uh, Rob uh, from uh, British Muzzle Loaders uses in his lovely videos. Um, and only then did they get an issued to British troops. And also the Mark II was upgraded, I'm sorry, the pat second pattern was upgraded to the third pattern. It gets very confusing. You have no idea how many times I've taken this. Um, so then the third, the Mark I, third pattern is uh, sort of a definitive Mark I, uh, which then gets issued in uh, large volumes to the troops. And then you have the Mark II, and so forth. But um, first, let's get into the guts of this. So I've pulled everything apart for you, and uh, we'll start here on the bottom with the uh, lever assembly and trigger assembly. Now the lever is uh, nothing special, short lever, however. Um, particular bit is this part here. Now that is a uh, tumbler sear, so it's in between the tumbler and the trigger, and it takes an awful lot of force um, off the trigger because the tumbler here is solicited forward by the mainspring and pushes against this part. However, the trigger here just needs to pivot ever so slightly to trip. So really, really very little force on the trigger, which gives a lovely trigger pull. Uh, also, the, the camming surface is here, so this is nice and smooth, and so is the back here. There's no catch between the two. So when you do pull the trigger, these two just roll relative to each other, which even uh, which improves the trigger even more. However, um, that part was basically proved to be unnecessary. It gave an a slightly too good trigger pull and also uh, it was prone to breakages so in the end they remove this part altogether and they extend a spur directly on the, the uh, tumbler to interact with the trigger which gives a relatively horrible trigger pull compared to this one and there we go I guess uh, service life tops uh, match triggers obviously now this, uh, I mentioned in the intro that uh, the very first patterns had a, uh, a safety which would have been installed in this area but this uh, trigger housing was produced once the uh, safety mechanism was abolished completely because this has uh, no cutouts or plugged holes that would indicate that this once had a safety. 
And the other characteristic feature of the uh, Mark 1s is the exposed nose of the trigger. So if I mission that, when you pull the trigger, you can see the nose here is uh, riding up from the bottom of the trigger housing. Now this presents a problem because uh, if you're out and about in the field, in the savannah or wherever, you could very easily get a bit of grit, mud, twig or something stuck in there, like so. And um, then you have a problem because your trigger is basically pulled or half pulled. And this would mean that uh, when you're reloading and uh, close your bolts, you had the chance of either having a direct slam fire because the uh, trigger spur, the um, trigger sear would simply ride over the trigger, or um, you'd have an extremely light trigger and have a you know, negligent discharge, hopefully in the direction of the enemy. So, in Mark IIs, this housing is extended so that the nose here is shrouded and you don't get any more ingress of dirt in there. And otherwise, uh, if we look at the breech block, this is a uh, breech block that has been built or adapted for the reinforced firing pin, which was one of the first modifications. You can see that by the SB here on the, on the shoulders. And um, underneath we have a single gas hole in case of ruptured cases, which was not unknown in those days, obviously. Um, and it's retained in the housing with this lovely bronze pivot pin. Now the bronze pivot pin is retained in the receiver by this little captive screw here. And this was uh, known to fall out, which is a bad thing. Um, so this was replaced by a very sturdy split pin which uh, if you've dis, uh, disassembled the later patterns, you'll know it uh, takes quite an effort to knock out. So, oh, and incidentally, this is, has been blued in its service life, or browned. Uh, the Mark I originally would have been shiny, polished uh, metal. Um, this was seen to aid bore inspection, which I can understand, but obviously prone to rust. So uh, the Mark II onwards uh, have this um, with a uh, finish blued or browned. So this one obviously underwent that modification later on to uh, keep it up to date with the later patterns. So since the camera's up close I'll uh, show you a couple of features of the rifle. Now we have this murderous checkered butt plate here which gives you a lovely waffle pattern on your skin if you're not wearing uh, enough clothing when you fire this with full service loads. And uh, here we have a nice stock marking, Mark 1, and the sling swivel here. This was abolished on the uh, third pattern Mark 1, except for rifle regiments. So whether this rifle remained in the rifles or simply missed out on the uh, removal of it, we'll never know. And here we have the receiver. Now it's uh, marked 1873, the barrel is actually 1874. But uh, it's all matching, anyway. Now you can see the rear sight. You can see that. You can see the notch. There is tiny. I probably can't really give you a good sight picture with it, but uh, I guarantee that it is extremely shallow. And so it's quite difficult to get an accurate uh, sight picture. And that was also modified. You see in Mark II onwards, this is much deeper. Uh, you've got a nice U groove there with the notch in the bottom to so see, uh, give you a, a much nicer sight picture. Aside from that, there's the uh, cleaning rod. Now this has also been adapted. It's been uh, usually it was a little more bulbous, but uh, this one has been uh, modified to be a bit slimmer. Official modification, Mark III, so that you could it could enter the neck of a fired case. So you can knock it out should it be stuck in the chamber. And it's held in place by a little catch here underneath in the wood. And a um, little ingenious system to release it. You have a camming surface on the cleaning rod, you can see there. 
So to re here it's captive, to release it, you just simply twist and it pushes the cleaning rod away from the catch and you can pull it out. I like that, it's very clever. And let's not forget the bayonet, of course, because they don't like it up them. Now, uh, the early, early stages, there wasn't a specific bayonet for the uh, Martini Henry. So uh, what they did have was uh, copious amounts of uh, Enfield rifle musket bayonets. So they used those. And uh, of course, the uh, shank here was too large. And all they did was to push them. So the socket here, I think you can just see the line of the bushing. And then this sock, this bushing then brings it down to the diameter of the uh, Martini Henry barrel. Otherwise, it's a completely standard bayonet. And indeed, the Martini Henry official bayonet was just the same, with obviously a smaller socket. So there you go, I hope that was interesting. Um, now you know what to look for if you see uh, Martini Henry's in Iraq, maybe you'll, you'll spot one of these uh, tucked away somewhere. Um, and uh, apologies to any aficionados, um, I'm sure I've missed something out and the corrections will be in the comments I'm sure. So that leaves me to say thank you uh, all for watching and uh, thank you for all your support as usual on uh, Facebook, on Instagram and on Patreon, more importantly. And uh, I shall see you again in the workshop very soon. Bye.